I'm wearing the same shirt. Is this is my like this is my sexy shirt. <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me. This is such an honor to come and speak to all of you about my biggest passion, which is not just education, but it is online education that allows all of us to be able to share our interest and love of science with the entire global community. I want to talk today about some ways that right now, right after this conference, all of you can connect to this global community and can make a difference in how science is taught and learned by students all over the world. I'll give a short review of a number of trends that I see developing in online curriculum. But much that I talk about is going to be focused on what I see as the coming future of how people like you will be able to change some ingrained bad habits in the current science education institution. So I look forward to talking to you about these changes that you all have the power to make. I want to start off, though, with something that's not quite so sexy. And this is, uh, as, as Don said, I spend a lot of my free time making uh, chemistry and, and science education videos that I put up on YouTube. This is one that doesn't cover scientific content, but I dressed up as three different people, one with this lovely black wig on. And these three versions of myself, I did some special effects, had a conversation with each other. And what we were basically talking is, about was why science sucks so much. <laughs> now, I'm probably talking to the wrong crowd here because <laughs> you guys are going to a science school. And I don't necessarily get the impact that I want when I discuss this at my home school, which is MIT in Cambridge. But I think many people in the general population would agree that everyone hates science, or at least to reframe it in another way. Instead of asking, why does everybody hate science, a more appropriate question might be, why is scientific literacy not widespread in the population? Why are many members of the public, why do they feel distanced from science? Why do they feel distanced from people like us who do science, technology, engineering, and math as a profession? So, I'd like to start with this, and I was hoping that I could get some feedback from you guys of not necessarily why do you hate science, but if you talk to just a general person in the population in, in, in Korea, in the United States, anywhere you can think of, why do you think they might agree that everyone hates science? Or why might they feel alienated or disconnected from the scientific establishment? Any ideas you have? would be very welcome. Please, and, 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 and tell me your name, too. Oh, okay. I'm Yoon Chong-shae okay. from this school. Uh -huh. And I guess one thing about science that makes it distant, distant is a lot of jargon. A lot of jargon. Absolutely, a lot of jargon. I'm gonna, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm going to write this up here. <laughs> I love these markers. I... Uh, Right after college, I, I taught at a Hagwon in Seoul, and I haven't, I haven't used like all oh, these dry erase markers, like bring back memories. You can't get these in the states that, that are, look like this. Anyway, okay. So jargon. What else? Yes. I'm Claire from British Tech. Yes. And I think people find it that science is very hard and boring. Hard and boring. Great. What else? Please. There are stereotypes about science. Absolutely. It's taught in school forcefully. And I guess they feel sort of scared to find science. Sure, 
Sure. Does anything else come to mind? Yeah, please. Yep. Maybe we are actually distancing ourselves from the general public. Maybe we are. <laughs> Maybe scientists and practitioners of engineering and science are distancing themselves. And anything else? Yes. Yeah, my name is Nathan from HIT in China. Uh -huh. And I think the reason that it's too complicated to, under, to be understand. Sure. Sure. I'm going to stop writing this down because I think it's taking too long. <laughs> and I'm sorry to have stopped on yours. It has nothing to do with... It was a great comment that it's just so difficult that it can be hard to wrap your head around and, and, and to make sense of it. Yes, please. Sure. And let's get one or two more. Yes, please. Uh, tell me what um, you know, the CFD can't go and at least uh, that is not practical. So it's uh, without the area and no area. I'm sorry, can, can you say, can you say that again a little louder? It's not practical. Not necessarily practical. OK, cool. You guys hit on almost everything that I could think of myself. So you're in a very, very, a very astute group in that regard. I want to talk largely about the way that internet video can change many of these negative aspects of science that may be distancing it or us from the general population. But I also think that the science education establishment, the way science is traditionally taught, is responsible in many ways for creating some of these problems. And I think, as I see it, much of what we've described there can be lumped into these three main categories. And I'll talk about the ways that various pieces of media can help address these. I, first, and I think it was like the, one of the first things that was mentioned here. I think that you know, science education, as it's presented right now, can be very dry and boring. And so some students, or even many students, have trouble mastering the basic concepts. Okay, I, think, I think we can agree on that. The second is that science education rarely organizes isolated knowledge into larger narratives. Now, we talked about jargon earlier, and so I apologize for like jargoning up here the second one. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say, and I'll get into this in more detail later, is it's all too easy to just memorize what a bacterium is, what the Krebs cycle is. It's too easy to memorize Newton's second law of physics and not connect it to a larger picture, right? So that young students, or even not so young students, don't understand why these isolated pieces of information are important when they're not in a broader context, in a broader narrative. And the third thing, uh, and this may be new to you, this is where I think that uh, online content has the biggest potential for change in how we think about teaching and learning in science, is that science education doesn't accurately distinguish between the products of science and the process of science. What I mean by that is there's a whole body of facts and definitions that are the product of science. But the process of science is what happens in laboratories all across the world where that information is actually created. And I'm going to talk about that third point later on, and I think I'll uh, better refine the difference between the process and the product of science. So to get to our first point, talk about how science education can be dry and boring, and some students have trouble mastering the basic concepts. This is true, and it may be true for some of you. It was probably true for many of your friends in high school as you were doing well and you were watching other people struggle. What's so great about being able to reach a global audience through internet video or through blogs or through Twitter is you have the power right now to change this, this misconception. Sometimes it's not such a misconception, but you have the power to change this. I think one of the most important things to do is to take a topic that you're really interested in and think about how you can make this not dry and not boring and engage learners 
in, 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 engage learners in this information. I want to give you a quick example of something that you could do on a blog, something that you could do by making a video right now. I'm going to talk about one of my favorite subjects of all time, bacteria and viruses, which is microbiology. But I think all of you have topics like this that get you really excited that you could put into a similar form and reach out and share it with students all over the world. I'm going to talk about this very quickly. Um, I'm very interested in bacteria and viruses. And I'm particularly interested in the way that viruses infect bacteria. Okay? <laughs> now, now, I apologize if anyone... Has, has, has anyone seen this before? Can I see a show of hands if anyone's seen me? Okay, good, good. I, I apologize if you've seen this, this talk of mine before. I, I'm not going to go too, uh, too slowly here. So... <laughs> We start out here with a, with, a, with a happy little bacterium. And maybe this happy little bacterium is like living in your stomach, or maybe he or she is, is living on like a spoiled piece of bread or something like that. And all of a sudden, this bacterium starts thinking, gee, I don't, I don't feel so good. <laughs> and he's beginning to get a little worried. And then all of a sudden, his stomach rips open and he sees this piece of a virus head sticking out from his insides. Now, if you're a bacterium, this is like the most terrifying sight in the world. Okay? But even worse is what comes next. Ah! When he bursts open, releasing all of these viruses. Okay, now if you're a bacterium, this is horrifying. But if you're a virus, you cross those little arm leg things of yours and you think, we rule. Look at this. And one of the reasons why, why this virus is so proud of himself is because this took a lot of planning. What happened is before all of this horror happened, a virus infected a bacterium by taking DNA and slipping it in to that bacteria. There's bacteria DNA and there's virus DNA in red. Now that virus DNA made stuff, proteins that destroys the bacterial DNA and then it takes control of the cell. The virus DNA then tells the bacterium to make more copies of virus. And it makes more and more and more virus until there are so many that the cell bursts and dies. And this is one of the common ways that viruses can reproduce. But it's not the only way. Some viruses are much more sneaky. <laughs> OK. Now, when a secret agent virus infects a cell, it slips its DNA in just like the other one did, except instead of taking over the cell, the virus DNA slips silently into the bacterial DNA, and it doesn't do anything. It just sits there like a sleeper cell from a terrorist group, just waiting. It's stuck there in the bacterial DNA, and every time that bacterium divides and has babies, all those babies have the virus DNA in them too. And this process continues until, bam, there's some kind of signal, and all of the virus DNA pops out of all of the bacterial DNA at the same time. It starts telling the cell to make more viruses, and eventually all of these bacteria burst and viruses pour out of them. So right now, I've just told you about the two main types of viral reproduction. One of them on the left is called the lytic cycle. That's where DNA goes into a, a cell creates viruses right away, and the cell starts to burst. The other is called lysogenic, which involves secret agent viruses that stick their DNA into the cell. It gets stuck in or integrated into the bacterial chromosome, and then at a particular time point, it pops out and causes the cells to burst. Now, the point is, you all may have already learned this stuff, but you may have forgotten it because of the way 
that it was introduced. Okay? Now, I'm pretty sure that all of you could learn the difference between the lytic and the lysogenic viral cycles if you had to read it from a textbook. But many students in middle school, in elementary school, even in university, are struggling with this very content right now. I love putting stuff like this on the internet. Sometimes I do this in sort of a narrative cartoon form. Other times I'll do it in a blog form where I'll just have a whole bunch of these images with text. I'll make it sort of like a comic book. So I'll put it up on my blog or I'll put it up on YouTube and then students from all over start watching it. And they write to me and they're like, this is the first time I've understood this. (laughs) And I had a good time learning it too. All right. Now there were details that I left out of this. And I know that. This is like what I study. This is what I do my research on at MIT. So I know that I'm leaving out some details. But for a first pass, for a student who's never learned this before, but is super confused about the difference between lytic and lysogenic viruses and how they infect, something like this with a cute story and a simple path lets them understand it for the first time. So then when their teacher is describing it in class, They can follow along, and they can pick up, and they can go from there. Now, viruses and bacteria are very close to my heart. But I'm sure that every single one of you have topics in math, physics, chemistry, geology, biology, anything you can think of that are just as near and dear to your heart that you're just as passionate about. And all of you have the ability to think about these topics in terms of a story in terms of some sort of a funny, engaging narrative. You can make cartoon-style videos. You can put something like this in a blog. But you can do it right now by thinking about what gets you excited and how to communicate this information to other people. Keep it simple. Keep it fun. Get rid of some of those details that nobody cares about and get to the point. Think about that 14-year-old who's struggling struggling in class, trying to understand this topic that you're so excited about. Think about how you'll convey that topic to them. And think about how you'll get them excited. This reminds me of one of my friends, Elizabeth. Every day, she posts a new, uh, she, she, she does a new entry to her blog. Um, she's a, a fellow science student of, uh, 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 at MIT. And this is one about the difference between between scientists and engineers. She's obviously a very good artist, much better than I am, um, but gets tremendous feedback from people who, uh, who read her blog from all over the world and go to it sometimes just for fun, not even to like particularly learn the topics that she's describing, but she describes them in such an enjoyable, narrative way that people don't even necessarily do it for help with school. They just do it because it's a lot of fun. Now, video is something else that can achieve this purpose, all right? And here are just a a, a few examples of a project that I've been involved with at MIT where students are making videos that explain basic science concepts in really fun, engaging ways. They get, this is kind of hard to see, uh, but they get dressed up in silly costumes to talk through analogies and metaphors of how batteries work. They put Legos on various types of bridges and then apply a load to them to see how the difference between uh, adding trusses, using suspension and so forth, changes the amount of load that a bridge can hold. And then they break them all, measuring the amount of pressure that it took to break it. Uh, And then another group talked about the different layers of the earth by baking a cake and putting little Lego guys through it. All of this stuff, though, I want to convey is well within your grasp. All you need is the camera on your smartphone, a good sense of humor, which I'm sure all of you have. (laughs) Since you're laughing, like, yeah, you know, I, I can imagine you have a good sense of humor. And maybe even some silly costumes. And think about how you can make these topics that are so exciting for you come to life and be fun for younger students. Now, just as important as these silly narrative stories that get students engaged is genuine content coverage, all right? 
there are a number of people, I had to put myself in here, but I probably shouldn't. There are a number of people all over the internet who are making lessons that are not particularly exciting or not particularly engaging, that don't really have stories wrapped around them, but are hammering through and explaining basic content. Okay, they're providing lessons that supplement what students may or may not be getting in school. And so many students can go home, they can look on YouTube, and they can find information about how the Krebs cycle works, or how to tell what shape a molecule is, or they can look through derivations of motion equations on the Khan Academy. Although this information isn't as entertaining, it's just as important, because it gives students another way to get this basic content. And if any of you are more inclined to just do some lessons where you're explaining material in a clear, step-by-step -step fashion, all you are is a, a camera phone video away from being able to make instructional videos, posting them on YouTube to help students all over the place. And there are an increasing number of websites. Two of, of the best known now are Arnomia.com and Vesper.org that are online communities for individual content creators to upload their media, which can then be organized and accessed by students all around the world. So I encourage all of you to think about creating content that could fit in one of those two categories I described. And you truly will have the opportunity to reach, reach hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of students all over the world. Now, another problem with science education is that it rarely organizes isolated knowledge into larger narratives. Here's what I mean about that. I told you already that I'm really passionate about biology, particularly bacteria. Now, if you're like a 14-year-old in school, or even if you're a college student, there's plenty of information out there about bacteria. A lot of it sounds like this. These are two definitions I took right out of a high school biology textbook. Bacteria constitute a large domain of prokaryotic microorganisms. Typically a few micrometers in length, bacteria have a wide range of shapes ranging from spheres to rods and spirals. Or also, bacteria are a member of a large group of unicellular microorganisms lacking organelles and an organized nucleus, including some that can cause disease. Who cares? <laughs> really? Who cares? And if you are a 14-year-old and you're reading this in your biology textbook, you're going to be like, who cares either? And then, like, God forbid, I don't know if you guys remember having to do this, right? But it's like memorizing all the different types of bacteria and the proteobacteria and the spirochetes and the gram-positive and the green filamentous bacteria. And it's like, who cares, right? Because this is where that idea of a narrative comes in. Because these are individual little facts and the bigger story isn't clear. Now, textbooks have no shortage of information about bacteria, but it's all in these small little sort of factoid bits. These pieces of information which are disseminated through textbooks and through teaching which largely relies on the structure of textbooks is then often measured in multiple choice questions like this. Which of the bacteria is the cause of pneumonia? I think it's Streptococcus pneumoniae. Like, that's good. Or like, this is, this is one of my favorites. Um, uh, oh, penicillin kills bacteria by A, imprisoning them. It doesn't. It B, causes holes to develop in their cell walls, but who cares if you don't understand what the bigger picture is? Okay, what really breaks my heart about the way that science is being taught in schools and in textbooks is that students are getting only what I'm circling here in this red. They're memorizing definitions of bacteria and they're memorizing taxonomy, which is, in other words, all the different types of bacteria. But when I tell young people, and I speak a lot in high schools and colleges, particularly across the US, when I tell them that I study bacteria, they have all of these really interesting questions for me. What are the most dangerous types of bacteria? I've heard a lot about how some bacteria are becoming resistant to antibiotics. How does that happen? How and why do bacteria grow so fast? What does it mean to be a single-celled organism? 
How are bacteria involved in the production of wine, beer, cheese, kimchi, and so forth? But none of these questions will be answered in a biology textbook. And so I'm particularly concerned that increasingly students are able to define a virus, but they don't know what HIV AIDS is. They can maybe write out an equation for nuclear fission or nuclear fusion, but they don't really understand how a nuclear power plant works. Things particularly in the U.S. like stem cells are a hot topic of debate, and the opening keynote speaker talked a little bit about them today. But there are very few students who learn anything about stem cells in their high school biology class, or how a hologram works, or why iron rusts, what relativity is, or why light speed is important. All these are like really interesting, exciting questions that put these small pieces of information into a narrative, into a story, into a broader context. So textbooks aren't really going to do it. And many teachers aren't going to do it either. But I bet that pretty much all of you know the answers to almost all of these questions. And this is also something that you could start to work on and put answers to these questions in blogs or in internet video, in short Twitter pieces. And already, there are a number of blogs that are used to address these questions. Blogs where people go to just learn the larger story of science. Because that's what's so great about a blog. Nobody's going to read a blog if it's just a boring textbook-style list of definitions or list of taxonomies. And so there are increasingly a number of blogs around the internet. This one is talking about the passive effect, uh, I'm sorry, effects of passive smoking on snoring in preschool children, which is like kind of funny, but also interesting because it's putting some pieces of information from science into a broader context. Um, And stuff about the role that bacteria play in uh, the marine world as well as um, how... Uh, the brain is processing information more slowly than, uh, than we're receiving it. The world of science is so filled with fascinating stories, fascinating information. All you've got to do is go on Wikipedia to find a topic, but then figure out how you would convey that topic to students who aren't interested in memorizing these facts but want to know the big stories. What are stem cells? How do viruses infect? How does a nuclear bomb work? These are really interesting narratives, really interesting stories that students, young learners in science, don't have access to. They have access to all the facts, but they don't have access to any sort of a larger structure that answers the questions that they're interested in and pulls these facts together. So this is a fantastic way that all of you could have an impact on younger students' abilities and their interests in learning science. And it's not just younger students either. Like whenever I go home for vacation, I always tell my mom about the stuff that I'm doing in the lab. And she asks me questions like the ones that I put on that previous slide. And I realize there's like nowhere that she can go to learn these basic topics. She can't go to Wikipedia where everything is like described in this really dense academic language. She can't go to a textbook either. So that's where you guys come in, content creators like you who can put this information in context and reach a really broad audience. Now, one of the ways in which I think that science, I, I'm sorry, one of the ways in which I think that, that online content is going to have the biggest impact on the future of uh, science education is that textbooks aren't going to do it, but all of you guys could describe the difference because between what I call the products of science and the process of science. So who here is familiar with the topic of horizontal gene transfer? Has anyone heard about horizontal gene transfer? Great. I was worried you all would like have already known it. Oh, horizontal gene transfer is easy. Some organisms are endowed with the ability to acquire new genes and traits from external sources. This process is known as horizontal gene transfer and is a key determinant in bacterial evolution, often conferring such traits as antibiotic resistance, increased pathogenicity, and novel metabolic acti- capabilities right out of a textbook. 
there are three main types of HGT. In transformation, organisms take up DNA, di oh, I misspelled that, directly from the environment. In transduction, DNA is delivered into cells by infecting bacteriophages. Or in conjugation, DNA is transferred from a donor cell to a recipient cell via cell-cell contact through a process often referred to as mating. OK, so this is sort of like the really boring, decontextualized, jargony, awful textbook definition. But I'm sure all of you could do a much better job of explaining if you are making content on your own and sharing it on the internet. So there's one way that we can make this more accessible for people. We can talk about analogies. I always like to say that humans are really kind of screwed. Because we can only get our genes from our mother and our father through what we call vertical gene transfer, which is the reason why parents look a lot like their kids, because, whores, because genes for humans are inherited vertically. This is a picture of, of, of three generations, a friend of mine, her mother, and her grandmother. And you can see a striking similarity in their facial features. They all look so similar because those genes are inherited vertically. Unlike humans, Bacteria, though, have the remarkable ability to acquire new genes from their neighbors throughout the course of their lives. So take a look around this room and think about the broad variety and diversity of genes that are right here. And think about if you were bacteria, you could go to your neighbor and be like, could I borrow that gene that makes your hair blonde? And I'd be like... Absolutely, and I would like some dark hair. And we could just swap, and then my hair would start growing brown, and whoever took my hair gene, their hair would start growing blonde. Now, humans can't do this, but bacteria do this all the time, and that's why we, we call it horizontal gene transfer, because bacteria are getting some genes vertically from their parents, but they're also, within a particular generation, able to swap and trade genes with each other. So this is horizontal gene transfer. It's pretty cool stuff. If we could do horizontal gene transfer, humans, we would probably trade like really superficial genes. Like, oh, I want a different color eyes. Or like, I want better defined abs or something like that. You know? <laughs> Actually, I don't. My abs are great. But, <laughs> um, but bacteria are not so superficial. And they, when they're doing horizontal gene transfer, they trade pieces of DNA that code for things like antibiotic resistance and increased pathogenicity, things that are really clinically relevant. Because now, we've got all these bugs trading around these pieces of DNA that make an entire population very quickly resistant to an antibiotic. OK, so in other words, we took this complicated definition and simplified it with some analogies and some humor. OK, but still. I'm focusing only on the products of science. Scientists in the past have done experiments about horizontal gene transfer. And we can sum up these experiments in boring textbook ways, or we can sum up these experiments in um, more entertaining ways. But in both cases, all we're doing is just giving a summary of experiments that have already happened. OK, this isn't what science is. Science isn't just memorizing horizontal gene transfer in a boring way or an entertaining way. Science is a process. And this is what I'm talking about when I discuss the difference between products of science and process of science. Everything I talked to you about previously about horizontal gene transfer, that was the product of science, things that were created by experiments. I want to talk a little bit about the process now. Here's a story. It's an old story that, like many things in microbiology, is very dear to my heart. But as I've continued saying throughout this, this, this seminar, all of you, I'm sure, can think of similar stories in your specific fields that you could share with a broad audience. Here is horizontal gene transfer as told as a process. Okay, There are two types of a certain kind of bacteria, which is called streptococcus pneumoniae. As I'm sure you know, you can take a petri dish, which is a round dish, and you can grow bacteria on it. And the bacteria make little circles known as colonies. 
So there are two types of streptococcus pneumonia. One of them makes rough colonies that are all jagged, and the other makes smooth. Now, about 100 years ago, some scientists started studying the difference between rough and smooth streptococcus pneumonia. Okay? And they discovered this, that when the rough type of bacteria was injected into a mouse, the mouse lives. Okay? Now we're talking process. Sure, this is a fact, but what can we learn about this? This is really basic. But I'm going to talk you through this so you can think about the thought process that might be involved if you were looking to make something like this to engage young learners on your own. So anyway, we inject rough bacteria into a mouse. The mouse lives. What does that experiment tell us? Somebody raise your hand. This is an easy one. Okay. Exactly. The rough bacteria or the R bacteria is harmless. Okay. Now, the S bacteria, we inject it into a mouse and the mouse dies. What can we learn from this piece of information? Louder. It's absolutely fatal or it's lethal. So R is harmless, S is lethal. Now it gets a little bit more interesting. The scientists take the S bacteria and they boil it. They boil it for a while, they let it cool, and then they inject it into a mouse and the mouse lives. What can we conclude from this piece of information? The smooth bacteria become inactive? Yeah, because it's boiled. Presumably because they've been killed by the boiling. Okay? So we've got these three pieces of information. The important thing is, is as we're going along this process, we're reasoning. Now, here's the beginning of where horizontal gene transfer comes in. The scientists discovered something really fascinating. They took smooth bacteria and they boiled it. But then they mixed it with rough bacteria. They mixed the cooled, boiled S. They mixed it with the R and they injected it into a mouse, and the mouse died. And what was particularly interesting was they then took the mouse's blood, and they put it on a Petri dish, and they got smooth bacteria out. This is where it begins to get interesting. But what, what does this show? Somebody raise your hand. What is, what is this last piece of information? show. What conclusions can we draw from this? Please. Absolutely. Absolutely. The only thing that I'm going to say is I think you already know you know the end of the story. <laughs> but we don't yet know that it's DNA. Right? Just based on the information here, we don't, know that, we don't yet know that it's DNA. We know that there's something in that killed smooth that affects the rough and is able to turn the rough into smooth bacteria. So we can say that the killed S contains a substance that can transform the R into S, making it lethal. Okay? And this diagrams what I was talking about up there, that the killed S, something in that killed S, interacts with the R, we inject it into a mouse, and we get smooth bacteria. Okay, now, here's where the horizontal gene transfer comes into play. A hundred years ago, scientists didn't know what it was that was making the rough bacteria smooth. They knew that there were essentially four things that were busting out of these cells when they boiled them. They knew that there was DNA, so here's like some smooth bacteria that's getting all busted up because it's being boiled, and it breaks up into these pieces. And they knew that there were four things coming out. There is DNA, RNA, protein, and lipids. These are four components of cells. There are also carbohydrates. You, know, you, know, you, you, know, you may know about carbohydrates, but they weren't too worried about the carbohydrates. So they're like one of these four things is involved with making that rough bacterium smooth. So here's how they go about testing it. They use four chemicals that can 
each destroy one of these type of molecules. Okay? Something called DNase destroys DNA. Something called RNase destroys RNA. Something called protease destroys protein. And detergent destroys lipids. Lipids is just a fancy name for fats. And so what they do is they repeat that experiment where they take the R and the boiled S. But they do it four times and they add a different chemical to each one of these. One they add DNAs to, one RNAs, one protease, and detergent. In the, in the example where the detergent was added, the mouse dies. The mouse also dies with protease, but the mouse dies also with RNAs, but the mouse lives when they add DNAs. And that was because, well, can, can, anyone, can anyone tell me why? Why did the mouse live when they added DNAs? Because the DNA is what was turning the R into S, so the DNA destroys it. Now, why is this important? This is important because these are the experiments that scientists first did to show that horizontal gene transfer was happening. Okay? This isn't a memorized definition. Okay? This isn't a boring memorized definition. It's not like a fun entertaining memorized definition either. But it's completely different. And this is the process behind science. This is what scientists do every day. They don't memorize definitions. They do experiments like this. They work through thought puzzles one step at a time to come to the conclusions which we then memorize in textbooks. Now textbooks aren't going to change to incorporate the process of science. But all of you, as I've said, I'm sure, can think about various aspects of your own fields and find these stories, these narratives, these processes that are within those fields. And you can think about how to make blog posts or videos that describe these, uh, these stories as puzzles and get students really excited about the problem that I see right now with a lot of textbooks and a lot of science education, but can be fixed with a lot of online content because it has this global distribution capability, is what I call the TV Guide problem. In the States, we have this, this magazine called TV Guide. And it provides these, these very, very short summaries of TV shows. Here's some great ones. The Real Housewives of New Jersey. On this week's episode, a reluctant Teresa and Jacqueline have a meeting, but things quickly sour. Meanwhile, Caroline's husband makes a stunning demand. Melissa and Joe receive an interesting offer, and Kathy adds spark to her sister's love life. This is like a textbook, right? It's like, this isn't the process. The process is actually watching the TV show, right? The process of science is doing the experiment and figuring out how the textbook got to that summary. TV Guide, they already watched it for you, and they just give you this short summary. So I don't think that biology textbooks are much different from TV Guide. They're giving these short summaries. Transformation is the process by which organisms take up DNA from the external environment but they're not actually explaining the scientific thinking, the scientific process, the puzzle solving that went on behind the scenes. They're giving you the end product, but they're not giving you the science. But all of you can think of the stories, the scientific narratives within your own fields and make content that that circumvents the textbooks and introduces young people to what science is really about. The story that I told you about textbooks reminds me a lot of a friend of mine who is a fabulous piano player. And you may be familiar with with beauty contests like like Miss America. I'm sure they have some similar in in South Korea. And there's a a, a talent competition where all of the contestants have to show some sort of amazing ability. And what my friend does is he teaches many of these beauty pageant participants how to play one song on the piano, one amazing concerto they learn. And it's the only thing they can play. 
and it's memorized. They couldn't play anything else. They can't even read music. But he teaches them how to majestically play one piece. Okay? That is like these textbooks. Okay? Just because you can play that one piece doesn't mean you can actually play piano. Just because you've memorized this definition doesn't mean you understand the scientific thought process that got you there. So that's why it's so important, I feel, to introduce young students to what science is really about. I love this show. I don't know how many of you guys watch it. But I always show the first episode of Iris in my chemistry class because I don't know if you guys remember it. It was on a, a couple years ago. It's really complicated. You've really got to understand not only what's going on in the show, but the broader picture of tensions and so forth between, between North and South Korea. And I always tell my students that they need to understand science as well as they have to watch and rewatch that first episode of Iris for it to make sense. That a, a short, memorized summary of what happens in the first episode of Iris isn't nearly the same thing as watching the whole thing through and understanding why the various characters are acting the way they are. Iris, in many ways, is a mystery. People love mysteries, and people love puzzles, which is why I think that I've gotten such a great response from the puzzle-style scientific process videos that I put on the Internet. I frame them like mysteries, like puzzles, like the one that I did with you about uh, horizontal gene transfer and the mice dying. Sometimes I'll dress up in silly costumes with friends, and we'll make it like a Sherlock Holmes or an Iris kind of mystery, like there's some sort of conspiracy that we need to be cracking. We make it really fun, and students really enjoy it. But more important than anything, they finally understand the process of science. I'm reminded of the introduction to this high school biology textbook. And I feel bad saying anything bad about Ken Miller because he was, my, he was one of my most transformative co- professors in, in college, but he writes this awful high school chemistry textbook. <laughs> and in it, at the end of it, he says, um, uh, we agree and we, we uh, no, I'm sorry, that's the wrong thing. He says, if all of this seems like heavy stuff, it is. But there's another reason we wrote this book, and that's not a secret at all. Science is fun. Biologists aren't a bunch of serious, grim-faced, middle-aged folks in lab coats who think of nothing but work. Maybe that's true, but you'd never know it from reading a biology book. Like this guy is talking about how you need an inquiring mind to be a scientist, the patience to look at nature carefully, and the willingness to figure things out. But the textbook that he wrote would never give students the opportunity to do any of these things. All they're going to be able to do is just memorize a bunch of definitions. There'll be no opportunity to see how you actually figure things out in science, how you have to apply an inquiring mind, and how you have to look at nature carefully. But this is all something that you guys can change by introducing younger students to the process of science through global, you know, through a global reach by creating various types of content. The funnier, the better. The sillier, the better. But the more you can engage with young people and teach them that science is not all bad, it's not all jargon, it's not all memorization, all the better. This is, this is, this is great stuff. So just to quickly review some of the points. I didn't talk too much about the actual modes of how you can create this content because I imagine that you guys are a very tech-savvy group. And there are a lot, I see, I see like a lot of cameras and video cameras and cell phones in the audience. You don't need really a tutorial from me about how to actually make a video. But I'm hoping that you'll keep in mind some of the more pedagogical, some of the more teaching elements that we talked about here. First of all, that all of you have the power to take elements of science and make it fun and enjoyable and explain it. You also have the ability to take small pieces of information and tie them to these broader questions. How do nuclear reactors work? What are stem cells? What is human cloning? These are questions that students and adults all have, and there's nowhere that they can go to have them answered. Nowhere until you guys start making the answers and putting them online. And finally, I hope that you'll think about the possibility of creating content that shows young students the difference between the products of science and the process of science. 
framing the scientific exploration process as a detective story, as a mystery, as a puzzle. Show them how to think through stuff, not just memorize and define. I really hope that all of you will consider the broad impact that you can have by engaging in any of these activities and sharing the passion and knowledge that you have of science with a broad global audience of both younger students and adults. So thank you very much for your time. Any questions about anything? Yes, please. Yes, yes, absolutely. So, um, so I just graduated last week from MIT. <laughs> In fact, this is the first official thing I've done as Dr. DeWitt. So it's like, it's a big, it's a big thing for me. So yes, through the whole time that I was making all this content, I was working as a as a lab research scientist. Yeah, well, I never sleep, first of all. So that, that helps. Yeah, it takes, takes a ton of time. I thought that it was so... So I, I taught high school for a few years before I went back to grad school. I taught, I taught here, in, in, well, up, up, in, up in Seoul, uh, and also uh, in, in, in the States as well. Um, and I was frustrated by how I was so excited about science, how I just love science. But students weren't getting the excitement that I got from their textbooks and from many other teachers, and just from sort of the way science was taught. So that's what got me really excited about making videos, because I was able to, I started out making videos just for my own students, putting them on YouTube, and then people from all over the world started watching them, and I started getting invited to you know, places like this to give, to give talks. That was just like so exciting, because I love to spread that excitement about science. So it was just sort of that passion for wanting to explain things in a fun way that, that kept me kept me engaged and interesting. Is that, does that adequately answer your question? Yeah. Yes, please. How did you, how did you decide to go for PhD? Because like, uh, I remember I watched a PhD movie, a sexuality and movie, and it was such a, you know, give a bad in, like, sort of representation going to PhD. Yeah. So uh, how do you actually overcome that kind of like feelings and then decided to go for PhD? That's a great question. That's a great question. I love teaching, but I've always also, I love puzzles, I love mysteries, and I love the process of science. I love, I love doing research, and I love learning new things. So that got me excited about going back to school and doing a PhD. But more important from a pragmatic level, much of what I talked about today with you guys is um, seen as, uh, it's seen as very opposed to much that's going on in education, at least in the United States. And when somebody says the sort of things that I'm talking about, many people within the educational establishment um, don't necessarily want to listen or they want to argue back and so forth. And so for better or for worse, I realized that having a PhD would allow me to have a bit more credibility when I was talking about various problems in the education system uh, that I hope that our country and, and, and the world sort of in general, I hope, can, can, move to, can move to correct. So I wanted to have that credibility to be taken, taken a little bit more seriously. Yeah, thank you. Yes? What do you think is the biggest issue that arrives from um, just between the science and the work? Oh, that's a great question. I think there are many issues. But uh, the biggest, I think, right, well, okay, so for, first of all, um, my broad intellectual answer is I think it's a real shame that the general public, many in the general public, can't take, can't take part in this amazing intellectual endeavor that is science, that is, that is you know, essentially uh, the, the empirical process by which humans are, are, are learning their place in the universe. Right? I think literature is great. I think languages are great. But I also think that science is every bit as intellectual as 
as, as any of those areas. So I think, I think that's intellectually a shame. I think much more practically, it's a shame that um, many people in society aren't able to engage in, in meaningful debate about, say, whether vaccines are safe for their children or not. You know, that's something that isn't, isn't as big of an issue uh, in Korea right now, but is huge in the U.S., right? All these people now who are denying their children vaccines because of, uh, you know, just the pseudoscience that's going around. It's not true at all. It was based on a ridiculous study that was unredacted because the guy said he made it up, but people still don't believe it. And so, so I feel that because of that, there's a sort of general distrust of scientists and science because people don't understand science as process. They understand, they, they many think it's just memorized facts. And what's the difference between one memorized fact and another memorized fact? But if you understand it as a process of asking and answering questions, it's, um, it's, more, uh, it's easier to understand where, say, scientific conclusions come from, where you can come to the conclusion that, say, vaccines are safe, that they're not killing the children that they're being vaccinated, because you understand the scientific process that, 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 that got to that point. Great question. Yes, please. Uh, do you have any plans of becoming the next Bill Nye? I would love to be the next Bill Nye. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes? Uh, my question is that because blogs are so easy to get access to and everyone can write stuff on their own blog, so of course. wouldn't it increase this kind of distrust because some people might not write things that are true on their blog? Mm-hmm. That's a very good question. I, I think textbooks may be able to be changed eventually. I worked for a year for a textbook company, and I, I, had, I had a very disappointing experience um, that I won't go into just because it's too boring. Um, but text, textbooks are written, um, they're, they're, there's, there's a large political and business bureaucracy that surrounds uh, the writing and creation of textbooks. Um, and I got this job expecting to make all these changes and realizing how incredibly difficult it is to make even a small change um, and realizing that the producers and publishers of, of textbooks for educational use are not particularly interested in producing content that teaches. They're just more interested in making something that a school district can check off the list and say, we bought the book and our kids have textbooks. Whether or not they're effective learning tools are, is not at the top of many textbook publishers' minds. And that really broke my heart to find that out. Um, but to have people say, it doesn't matter if the students can't learn very well from these. We just need to sell them, just move them out the door. Um, uh, in, in, in other companies and other organizations, it may be slightly different. But I certainly am really hopeful that the internet um, can sort of circumvent that whole process and then can maybe force the textbook industry to have to change um, when they see that other people are doing a better job of educating and engaging students than they are. Maybe that is how, how change can come in, in educational content. Great question. Yes, please. I agree with you. This online teaching is a highly effective way of teaching. But considering the medium of this education is online, right? So it means that only privileged students get this uh, resource. Mm-hmm. But to those like third world countries like Bangladesh or Africa, those kids, like even if they want to get this like good education, they cannot. So do sure. you like plan to sort of find a way to reach those students and that internet access? Absolutely. Um, have you heard of the Khan Academy? Yeah, excellent. So, so I'm I'm good friends with with uh, well, not good friends, but I'm, I'm, I'm decent friends. <laughs> so I, I know I know I know Sal Khan, and he um, he has a number of exciting ideas for getting uh, his content and from other content creators uh, to to underserved people in in Africa as well as other areas that don't have internet access. Um, we've, uh, th- there's been a lot of excitement about this one laptop per child project, which makes you know, very affordable laptops, uh, but they don't necessarily have internet access. And so there, there's the idea of putting educational content on various flash drives 
and they're so cheap these days that you know you could you could hand those out um, to large villages. You could have sort of very small outposts where people could go with a flash drive and download a certain number of lessons and then come back a month later and get new ones and so forth. And pretty soon the, the Khan Academy will be trying to roll out um, implementations like that. Are they like the answer? Probably not, but they're, they're a good short-term solution, I think, until we can find a, a better way to deliver that content immediately to, to many of the people who need it most. Yeah, great, great question. Yeah, yes? To, and so, uh, spe- specifically people in economics yeah. and business, or? Like the uh, people whose major is not, uh, not the science or the economics. Yeah. I would love to. I don't currently, I, I, I don't currently have plans to do it myself. But I have, um, I, I, my, my new project is, is to work on a very large website for educational video in all subjects that aims to make something sort of like Wikipedia, um, where anyone will be able to create content that will be organized. Um, And so it will be far greater than anything that one person would be able to create. So there'll be people making content for accounting and business and economics, and all of that will have uh, a home that you can go to to look for those subjects. I can tell you more about that afterwards. Thank you. Any other? Yes, please. Like, um, like I think it's quite uh, concentrated on like how to like amuse your um, audiences, right? Sure. And I do agree with your ideas, and I've benefited a lot from one of your videos, actually. <laughs> sure. But sometimes, uh, actually, one time I studied uh, from those videos to take a test, and I actually took it. Um, I found out that those like amusing oriented. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you look at most of the videos I do on YouTube, they're actually really boring. I talk, I solve equations, I do derivatives with very little fun and engagingness. So I think that I think that anything that is fun and engaging and exciting is an important part of a diet, but can't be the only way that we reach learners. I think that it's important often for students who are not as engaged as they might be to start out at the very beginning with stuff that is engaging and fun. That gets the basics across. And then it's like, okay, let me show you these formulas now. Um, let me show you how to derive this equation. Once you get that, I, 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 just personally, it's my opinion, I'm a big believer in the basics. And if, if you can just find a way to get that, that base level of knowledge across, you can then build on it with much more complicated uh, and much more, much more serious content. So absolutely. And if you check out my YouTube channel, you might be surprised by, by how, how the majority of content is, is not particularly fun or exciting at all. Um, because I, I, think that, I think that the two things play a very, have a very important relationship with each other. It's a great question. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Hewitt. The time is running very fast. And I would just like to thank him for his presentation. And on behalf of ISIS, Oh, thank you very much. Oh, lovely. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you.